Well, hello. Welcome to Joshua number four. This is our fourth, of course, in the series of getting into the book of Joshua. And today we're going to be starting in chapter three. We're going to be looking at the way of wonders. We're going to look at the whole chapter. I won't read the whole chapter at first, read just the first five verses, but I want you to read all 17 verses, become familiar with it. And so let's get right into it and started right away reading. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For you have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Well, you ought to be able to see why I've called it and entitled this message, The Way of Wonders. Because that's exactly what we want and what we want to learn and see. Israel, of course, is about to cross the Jordan into Canaan, the Promised Land. They're about to enter into a territory that they've never been before as a people. Joshua said, of course, back in verse 4, that you have not passed this way heretofore. Tomorrow, then, would mark a new era in their life and a new chapter in their history. It was a tomorrow that God promised would be blessed with wonders. Joshua said that in verse 5. You see it right there. He said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Well, really, isn't that our hope as Christians, that the Lord would do wonders among us? That tomorrow we might see the one we pray for saved? Or that the fact of the trial or tribulation to end is we want to see the promises of God on the other side of Jordan. Our future, our future and our tomorrows are often untried paths. It's a time of our life that has not yet been disclosed to us or discovered by us. I like that song, we don't know who holds tomorrow, or we don't know what tomorrow may bring, but we know who holds tomorrow. And he has promised that our tomorrows can really be one of wonders. Walking with God, preparing and following God, his way according to his will, is a way of wonders. So I want the future, your future. I would like and hope that our tomorrows, your tomorrows, would be full of wonders. We often look back and think, especially as we age, we look back and we think our best days were yesterday. Our best days are already gone. But no matter who and how old they were, especially with Joshua and Caleb, their best days were still ahead. Are the days of wonder behind you? Are our dreams of how it used to be? Is that what we dream about or how it's going to be? We have God's promise that tomorrow can be a day of wonders. And we must not allow the world the flesh, or the devil to steal our hope of ever seeing that great miracle of grace. I'm not talking about the healing of the lame or the blind, but I'm talking about the 
wonder of seeing a sin-sick soul saved or the healing of a backslidden Christian or to see a depression removed or discouragement taken away. I'm talking about the miracle it would take to get you through your trial and your trouble. Maybe the one you're experiencing right now. Now, if you noticed, I will say it's not the removal of that trial or trouble, but to get you through the trial or trouble. I remind you of what Paul said, that he was troubled on every side, and he was not distressed. He was in despair, but he was not destroyed. If you want a tomorrow that is full of spiritual wonders, then it calls for something on your part. And I want to look at those verses that we're talking about here in chapter 3 of Joshua. And I want you to notice two things, real simple this morning, or for you whenever you happen to be watching it. Again, he reminds them, you've never passed this way heretofore. Something brand new. The Lord's going to do wonders among you. How's he going to do that? I'm going to tell you, there's two things that are required. Number one, it's required of you that you be dedicated. And number two, there's got to be a desire. Those are the two primary points that we're going to be looking at. And both of these are going to involve a personal decision for you, or it might involve a corporate decision for an entire church. How about a church that would want to see the wonders of tomorrow? Then that church needs to make a point of being dedicated to the Lord and having a desire for his way, his will, and for his personal fellowship. Let's look first at this idea of dedication. And remember what he said again in verse 5, Joshua said unto the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. Now, before we even get there a little bit, you have to remember they encamped at the Jordan River for three days before ever crossing over. And maybe that was a good time for them of remembering and rehearsing what the Lord had done. We often need to be enriched by our memories and how to be mindful of the Lord and his love and how that he has never failed us. God, and if you remember the first three messages, that was emphasized. He said it, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you feel like that's the case, I want to remind you as a Christian, God hasn't moved. You have. They needed to respond to that command. Sanctify yourself. God is telling them and he's telling us to set ourselves apart to God. And to God alone, I, he says, I am the Lord thy God, and I will sustain you. I will protect you. I will provide for you. Trust me. Sanctify yourselves unto me. That's important. Let me give you a little bit that I think is an important statement for you and I to get. The wonders of tomorrow depend upon the sanctification of today. If you won't set yourself apart, and if Israel would not have set themselves apart, how could they expect to see the wonders that the Lord would do among them? Sanctification means dedication. It means there must be a renewal of our dedication to the Lord. And I'm talking about heart dedication. God is teaching them and he's teaching us that there is a proper heart response to this command. We need very much to realize that this is not and cannot be a mechanical means of entering into the way of wonders. You're never going to make it that way. Sanctifying ourselves is a matter of the heart. Remember, we sing a song, lay it all on the altar. 
We sing a lot of different songs about rededicating our life to the Lord again and again. We need to put God first in every way that we can in our life. The idea of entering into the way of wonders and dedicating ourselves, sanctifying ourselves is, and I'm encouraging you, make this day your door of opportunity. Make this day your way into the way of wonders. But understand this, for you and I, sanctification is never a one-time event. And you'll learn this as we go through and we see what happened to Israel when they failed. There is an actual sanctification. In other words, the Holy Spirit, God himself, sets us apart for our salvation. But there is an applied sanctification in which you and I choose our manner of living. And it may be that sometimes we get off course. It may be that we've turned a little to the left or a little to the right, and maybe we need to straighten our course out. Peter wrote a verse in 1 Peter, wrote two verses actually, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That means manner of life. We are to act in a manner that is equal to our new nature. In contrast to the old, that's what that verse is saying. In our actual or positional sanctification, we find that there is a provision made for us to be free from the power of sin as well as from the penalty of sin. This is the application of the Spirit's work in us. His work in us has an effect upon us and should change our manner of living. That's one thing you don't have to force people to do when they're really saved. They want to change. Why? Because of the work of sanctification internally. But the way of wonders begins with dedication. You want to see the way of wonders for your life? Then you know what you need to do? Sanctify yourselves. Dedicate your life. Then secondly, I want to notice that not only must there be dedication but there must be desire. Now, I'm going to be very specific with this because somebody will say, well, yeah, I desire to be in the way of wonder. Yeah, but it's not just the desire of the way of wonder that I'm talking about here. Number one, there's got to be a desire for God's glory. That's the most important thing. Do you really desire God's glory? You know, Spurgeon spoke of the need for Christians who live only for Christ and desire nothing but opportunities for promoting his glory. He talked about Christians who seek for opportunities of spreading his truth and for winning by the power of Jesus Christ those whom he has redeemed with his precious blood. In fact, he went on to state, and I'll put this up there for you. He said, we need folks who glow with intense heat. Men like thunderbolts flung from Jehovah's hand, crashing through every opposing thing till they have reached the target aimed at. Men impelled by omnipotence. That's the kind of desire we're talking about. A desire for God's glory to be used by him. We ought to be some of those Christians with dedicated lives who trust in God's way and desire his glory. That's one of the first desires if you want to step into the way of wonders. Secondly, I think we ought to desire not only God's glory, but we need to desire God's word. Let me show you something that's very interesting throughout this whole chapter, and in particular the verses that I read. 
because you're going to see they received a command. This chapter is one of commands. Notice, and they commanded the people saying, when, then, when you see the ark, then do this. You have, there's some things to do in the word of God. Now, I know that it's all of God's grace, but listen, you want to really get in the way of wonders? Then pay attention to what God says. Notice in verse 4, where he said, There shall be a space between you about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. In other words, there's a leadership. There is a pause here. But I think it, there really is something about reverence and respect and remembrance. Anticipate, too, the way of wonders. That's why, again, verse 5, I looked at it again. Sanctify yourselves, be prepared, dedicate yourselves, and anticipate that you're going to get into the way of wonders. Have hope, have trust in him. Notice verse 6, Joshua told the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over. Commands. Do you have a desire for God's word? Do you want to hear what God commands you to do? Look at verse 8 as well. He says, Now shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water, ye shall stand still in Jordan. Now we're going to see more a little bit about that, but you've got to remember that during this time the waters were overflowing. You say, well, how can all this happen? It's not yours to question. It's yours to find and desire God's word. Learn of God's word. You want to be in the way of wonders? Desire God's word. You think about it. They had marched under God's commands before. Wherever they struck their tents, wherever they marched, whenever they pitched their tents again and again, it was all under the leadership of God. But this is a new way. New commands are now needed. New directions must be received for this was a new way that Joshua said they had never been in before. You know, as we get older as saints, we learn that we have to adjust. We can't do the things the way we used to. There are new commands. There are things that we need to learn about some new directions. I'm different than I was 40 years ago. 50 years ago. This is a new chapter in my life. It may be a new chapter in your life, and it may be a new chapter in a church's life. So then we need to hear the word of God. Aren't you glad that his mercies are new every morning? (laughs) You know, God's word is not changing But the times were changing, and they called for instructions about how to live in this way of wonders. God's ethics and orders do not change, but our life experiences and our applications of the word do change. Each one of us are going to experience in our lifetime dramatic changes. And we always, in that way of wonder, need to learn and listen as you enter into that time. Don't ask for the trials and the troubles to be gone. Ask to learn. (coughs) Ask how that you can traverse through that trial and that trouble. You need to ask God what it is that you that he wants for your life today. God, what do you want me to do today? How do you want to use me today? Where do you want me to serve? What is your plan and purpose for my life at this stage of my life? And you need to be willing and ready and patiently wait for his direction. I'm going to give you one other little phrase here too. Tomorrow's wonders depend upon following today's directions. Imagine that. If you ignore God's word, 
If you think little of it, don't read it. How can you expect to find the wonders of tomorrow? I think it's important that you and I know that we're going to have some storms in our life. You can either try to direct the ship yourself, or you can rather let the author of the wind have the helm. It isn't always going to be smooth sailing. There are going to be storms, and sometimes there may be terrible storms. But God knows what he's doing. And he knows where he's taking us. Now, let's look at the last desire that I think we ought to appreciate from this particular passage. And that is, not only should we desire God's glory, not only should we desire God's word, but we ought to desire God's presence. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3, we've already read it. But he said, and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests of the Levites, the Levites bearing it, then shall you remove from your place. Well, I read that because of this. What in the world did the Ark of the Covenant represent? It represented God's presence. Let me take you a little bit further now into verses 9, 10, and 11 of Joshua chapter 3. And let's read those together. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither. And hear the words of the Lord your God. Do you desire God's word? Then listen to what he has to say. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. You don't know where you're going, but God says, I've got some leadership for you. My presence is going to go before you. That's what the ark represented. It symbolized the very presence and the power of God and his leadership. And he says, I want you to maintain that reverence. I want you to remember all of the times that I've led you and trust me, follow me. This way you'll know where I'm going. And remember, what does he say? Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you all of the enemies of God. To make application to that, his presence is essential to seeing the way of wonders and into seeing who holds tomorrow. If you have unconfessed sin, if you are unrepentant, the way of wonder can be lost. We can't afford to walk independent of the Lord and walk in the flesh. God's word teaches us the truth of the laws of the harvest in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh, you want to live in the flesh? He's going to reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Take you back into the Old Testament and remind you of King David. He was a miserable man when he tried to rule without God's presence. Instead of walking in the way of wonder, he walked in the way of the flesh. And you know what he did? He tasted the fruit of the flesh. That's what his harvest was. We ought to be like Moses in Exodus 33 and 15, where he said unto the Lord, If thy presence go not with me, carry us up not hence. Now, I want to end this by showing you the last three verses of this particular passage. And I want you to pay attention to the wonders that they saw. I want you to see how that normalcy 
was disrupted. The normal scientific way and pattern of things was disrupted. Let's look. And it came to pass, starting with verse 14. When the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as they bear the Ark were come into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest. Remember when we were talking about the fact that they had obstacles? There was no way they were going to get across this river. It was going to be trouble. And even if they could start to get in there, imagine the mud, the muck. How are they going to cross it? But as soon as the feet of the priest that bear the ark were dipped in the brim, the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam. That is beside Zaratan. Don't get lost in the geography here. People like to speculate. Pay attention to the wonder, the way of wonders. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, what happened? They failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. One more verse. Notice again. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Those waters that were flowing stood up in a heap, a very unnatural event. The priest stood on dry ground. Notice it says their feet went into the brim. They stepped into the water. There's an old song, step out into the water. It's what we need to do to trust God. What a way of wonder this was. What a way to begin this story, this journey. All natural order was dismissed. Ease of travel was granted. And God's glory was revealed to everyone. There wasn't a single person whose feet were wet, whose feet were muddied. Their way of wonders had begun. Now, in all of this, I go back to the fact, do you want to walk in the way of wonders? Now, I don't anticipate seeing any of the natural things around us change like they did. I don't imagine the Jordan River heaping up, but I do imagine that there is a way of wonder that we have no idea because we've never gone that way. Imagine a whole church dedicated and sanctified unto the Lord. Imagine a whole family. Imagine for the first time in your life that you are 100% sanctified and dedicated unto the Lord. Imagine the desire of your heart is for God's glory, for God's word, and for God's presence. That begins the journey into the way of wonders. Let's go together. Let's traverse this world in the way of wonders and see what God will show us. Dedicate yourself Desire God's glory, desire God's word, desire God's presence like never before. Make that commitment with me today. May God bless you and lead you in the way of wonder.